Lord, the project two has been assigned, um, and it does not involve any coding. It involves writing a planning domain. Um, you know, so the existing planners actually remember we had blocks world domain for which we wrote the action names, the preconditions, and effects. And uh, it turns out that you can uh, uh, write these in certain syntax called PDDL syntax. Um, you know, for any of the domains. And um, what we are asking you to do essentially is to write the actions for a particular domain involving robot going from room to room. Okay, and then try out whether your domain model works or not by feeding it to a planner that we supply to you. Okay, uh, so all the instructions are here, um, and um, I believe Kartik is uh, also trying to post a small uh, video, uh, basically instead of him coming and talking right now about the project when you are not even thinking about it, uh, I thought he would just have a short 10 minute or 3 minute video on you know a little more about uh, you know where the files are etc. Everything is here, um, but you know he'll also do that. Um, and I suggest that you get started early because there is no uh, extension on this. Um, you know, I know that we had two extensions for the two projects before, but that's not going to happen for this. There is no actual coding here. Um, and then I basically, it's, about, it's due two weeks from now, and then uh, by that time, we would be actually ready for the next project, which is on base networks. Okay, uh, that also, um, I'm, I can't be sure, but that also is likely to be modeling rather than coding. That's regarding the project too. As I said, get started and don't you know wait until the last minute. Um, I also opened um, this. I sent mail to people that if you want, you can send me feedback. I think about the last I checked, about three people did it. Um, so it's anonymous. So if you want, you should do it. Uh, if you don't speak up, I assume everything is fine and dandy because that's the only reasonable assumption I can make. Okay. Uh, questions? By the way, the Mr. Paul link is no longer available on the blog and in the mail archive. I only want to hear from you, not from everybody else on the internet. Um, so it's, it's basically in your email though. Okay, any questions? Okay. So I am going to get back to where we were, um, which is uh, we were talking about SAT solvers last class. Um, today's agenda is uh, I'll discuss uh, a little bit more about um, SAT solvers, at least two types of SAT solvers. One is a systematic SAT solver, and the other is what we will see as a local search SAT solver, which is an interesting kind of search. Um, and then uh, we'll also uh, find out, hear about something interesting called the phase transition phenomena in SAT problems. Um, you'll see why that's interesting. You know, it's like we normally heard phase transition uh, the last time in a physics class where when you try to boil water, um, all the water just wants to escape and become, um, you know, vapor exactly at 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, and before that, it's slowly evaporating, but at 100 degrees centigrade, it all wants to escape at the same time. And uh, we will talk about a phase transition phenomena in SAT problems, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's not directly right on the, it's, it's not directly related to whether or you know, how to design an um, uh, intelligent agent, but it's a very interesting phenomenon that we are very close to understanding in this case. Okay, so we'll talk about that. And after that, I will, depending on um, you know, time, you know, either today or next class, we will uh, segue from there uh, into probabilistic propositional logic, which is basically base networks. So we will look back at propositional logic, see what can be modeled, what cannot be modeled, and uh, what else do you want to model? You know, what kinds of pro you know, questions would you like to ask that are not answerable in the propositional logic? And then uh, uh, slowly go from there to probabilistic logic, which is basically base networks. Okay, so that's the agenda. And uh, so last class, when we were talking about SAT solvers, we agreed that 
first of all, all the problems, if you're doing systematic search, if you're searching for um, an assignment that satisfies all the classes, right? That's the whole point of, so I have been, I've given you these classes, and then you have to tell me assignments on P, Q, R, S, T, U, um, true, false assignments for them, such that all of these classes are satisfied. Okay, and then we notice that that's a search problem because you have to, there are two power n, um, if there are n variables, there are two power n models. Okay, and then you have to check one after other until you find one which works. Right, that's the idea. Now, if it's an easy SAT problem, hopefully, um, actually it's interesting. If it's an easy SAT problem, hopefully there are many, many solutions, so the very first model you pick would be a model. Okay, but you know you can't depend on that, so you actually search systematically through all the models. And the way to say search systematically is uh, pick a variable, consider true value one branch, false value another branch. In the true value branch, let's say you can pick one of those branches and then pick another variable, consider its valuations, and so on. Okay, so you have a search tree. The question was, should we do depth first or breadth first? And we convince ourselves that nothing other than depth first makes any sense. Why? Because all the solutions are at the leaf level. Okay, and they're all equally good. Those are the two important issues. Every model is as good as every other model, and all the models are at the leaf level. So there is no point in doing breadth first, or A star search, or IDFS, or any of those things. We just want to do depth first search. Okay, furthermore, we convince ourselves that at each point, you just have to pick one variable and consider true and false values for it. You don't have to consider all variables at all levels. So you don't have to backtrack. You don't have to second guess. Maybe I should have considered branching on Q here, not P. Which means in search terminology, you have to come back and branch on Q. If everything fails because you started with P, okay, then you can't come back here and branch on Q again separately because it will still fail. Okay, so we convince ourselves that the order in which the, I mean, so the order in which the variables are given values does not matter in terms of completeness, in terms of finding the solution. But it does matter in terms of efficiency. That was the Bill Gates example, right? Um, so you need a heuristic for hopefully picking the variables in the correct order. But if you don't have any heuristic, you just pick variables. Okay, one more thing. So this basically all of that is described on this left hand side here. Okay, one more thing is when do we stop? You know, you sort of doing depth first search. Depth first search is sort of a recursion. Okay, um, when do you stop? If any, if the current assignment that you have satisfies every one of the clauses, you're done. Now the interesting thing is when the assignment that you have satisfies every one of the classes, is it required that you have already set all the variables? Suppose I have uh, the following set of classes, PST, PQM, PJR, PWM, PSM, okay? I told you a whole bunch of classes. Okay, um, now if I say P equal to true, all classes are satisfied. I'm done. So my model is P equal to true. Now, didn't I say that models should tell you the valuations for each of the variables? Yes, they should. But in this case, you don't care what the other guy's values are. Do you see what I'm saying? You have essentially too many solutions. Any solution, where any model where P equal to true is a solution. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that does not change the fact that all solutions are at the leaf level. It is just that an entire subtree is full of solutions. That's okay, you would take it. You know, if I give you that kind of easy problems, you take it. Okay, so in the search algorithm, you keep going until you have an assignment. You know, remember the assignment starts with null and keeps adding one variable and its value, next variable and its value, next variable and its value, okay? At any time, if all the classes are satisfied, you're done. Point one. Okay? Point two is if at any time one of the classes is violated, 
then what do you do? What? Stop. Because once a clause is violated, whatever you do, it will never get unviolated. Violation is forever. You see what I'm saying? So if a clause is dead, that means this partial assignment already violates this constraint. So extending this assignment doesn't help. It's dead. The whole point of search, and we talked about it when we were talking about regression, one very important point of search is not to expand dead guys. If you expand dead nodes, they will you know, lead to more and more dead nodes. And you'll be wasting a lot of time. Right? OK? So one very important thing is if a partial assignment violates a clause, then just backtrack. Then essentially, you go up one level and look for the other valuation for the variable. You see that? So this, this already gives you a simple backtracking search, a simple backtracking search for SAT, SAT algorithms. OK? And so that's that algorithm. This is basically in your textbook, except I kind of write it out two things. Okay, in between. And if you remove those two things, it's a very simple backtracking algorithm. And it's a recursive algorithm. Okay, it's actually a very famous algorithm. It's called DPLL, um, Davis Putnam Lodgman and Loveland procedure. Um, and it's a systematic, it's one of the first very efficient algorithms back in 62, um, you know, from the time I was born. Uh, this was published in JSEM, which is like the top journal in uh, ACM, in, in computer science. Okay, um, so you notice that the function here basically is calling itself. That's a recursion. Okay, so what are you doing? You're essentially starting DPLL with the set of all the classes. Let us set of symbols yet to be given values and the current model. So that means notice that each of the symbols, they call them symbols, we call them variables, or propositions, they're all the same. Okay, so in the beginning you have null assignment. And so every variable is in this list of symbols here. As you pick a variable, you transfer it into this list, and you transfer it with true value ones and false value ones. Right? That's the recursion that goes on. OK, so I call DPLL with classes, symbols, and empty list. OK, and then here is the main body. OK, and the main body is saying, uh, notice that this can be, you, can, you could have come through, come to it at any, time, any point during the search. And so you have some symbols that have yet to be assigned, some symbols that have already been assigned. That's your partial model. And the ones that you've been assigned, you know what their values are according to the model. So model is saying p equal to true, q equal to false. OK, now you're trying to decide whether to go forward, whether to say I'm done, or whether to, um, you know, whether to say I died, or whether to say I'm done, or go forward by recursing further. So those are the three classes here. First, if every class in the classes is true in the current model, okay, then you're done. Even if, in fact, symbols is not empty, that means there's still lots and lots of symbols to be given values, you're done. Because the work that you're done already satisfied all the classes. That's like that, you know, every class starts with P. So if you set P equal to true, all classes become satisfied. Right? And then similarly, if some clause in clauses is false in model, then return false. So this is every class. This is some class. So if you are done, if this satisfies, then you come out of the recursion and return true. That means I found a model. And the model you actually found is this model. OK? And if any of the classes is violated, then you cut out of this recursion and say, I fail. And then whoever called you then should realize that they should call the other branch now. Right? OK? So return false. And then um, DPLL itself, then if either of those holds, then you come here. In fact, you may do something else that, you know, right now, let's assume you don't do anything else. So you come here. OK? And then now, basically, you pick some variable, p, and set p to true in one branch, p to false in another branch. 
And so the way branches are done is first call DPLL on the P22 branch. And if that returns true, you're done. If not, then you call this branch. This is actually, by the way, you know, here you're saying DPLL this R, DPLL this. And actually, if you in, in list, you if you write this in this R procedure one procedure 2, okay, and if the procedure 1 returns true, it would never call procedure 2. There could be syntax errors in procedure 2. You would never know. Because procedure 1 returns true, why do I need to look at procedure 2? So that's the lazy evaluation that actually Lisp does in many good languages too, okay? And that's the kind of R we have in mind. Try this, and if it fails, then try this. And below this, again, there'll be a try this, try this. <clears throat> and that's exactly how the search is implemented here. This doesn't take too much time to write. It's an extremely easy algorithm to write. This is a pure backtracking search algorithm. OK, it already, you know, in the worst case, it does 2 power n search, because you know, it'll go through all the models. But it does at least avoid, for example, if all classes get set as soon as you set p equal to true, it stops right away here. And furthermore, if all the classes, can, most of the classes basically get, I mean, every valuation of P, let's say, makes one class or another class be violated, then you'll die right away too. Either way, you'll say that there's no model or there is a model, here's the model. So it, in the worst case, takes two power n, but you know, sometimes it can take less than that. And it's a good algorithm. Any questions on this? You should understand this. This is a very simple algorithm. Okay, um, so then I want to do two improvements to this algorithm. There are actually, when I said, I told you that there are entire conferences devoted to improving SAT solvers, right? Uh, this is like a 62 algorithm, 1962 algorithm. In fact, what I showed you is not even a 1962 algorithm. I showed you the piece of the 1962 algorithm. They wouldn't have gotten an ACM paper, JACM paper for this. They did two more things that I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, which are kind of cute ideas. But then there are 10,000 additional ideas that have been developed for improving SAT efficiency right now. And it's like an entire area right now. And you can spend your lifetime just you know, understanding them and writing a new SAT software. Okay, But let's at least understand a couple of good ones. Okay, So two interesting ideas are this. This one, this algorithm does have an advantage that you know, if, it is, if it has a particular assignment, that is dead already, it has the gumption, it has the common sense not to expand that assignment further. But sometimes you may have an assignment on your hand, it doesn't look it is dead yet, but it will be dead anyway. Remember regression? You had nodes which are dead, but you don't really notice that they're dead. And you would be wasting your time expanding, expanding, expanding. Right? That can happen in SAT too. Okay? Here is a classic example. Um, suppose, you know, basically I just wrote that example there. Suppose I have a whole bunch of uh, classes. Okay? And suppose I have no better, um, you know, variable ordering heuristic than just going P1 to P2, P3, etc., up to P1000. How do I know? Okay, and I have thousand variables. Okay, and I have the following classes. P one implies um, P thousand. That means if P one is true, P thousand must be true, and P two implies not P thousand. That means if P two is true, P thousand cannot be true. It has to be false. Okay, and blah blah blah. Lots and large number of classes. Okay, so you started, you set P1 equal to true, P1 equal to false, you got P1 equal to true here, then you then set, I decided to set P2 equal to true, P2 equal to false, you now have P1 equal to true, P2 equal to true. Notice that you would not get to P1000 <laughs> until much later. Because you have, you know, you probably are just going first P1, then P2, then P3, etc. up to P1000. 
Do you realize that you're dead at this point? You all realize that, right? I mean, not you, but this particular assignment is dead. OK, because P1, P1000 can neither be true nor be false. That means I have no model. In every model, each variable must have a value. Remember where in the previous case where I said, as soon as P became true, all the classes became true. So I didn't care about the rest of the variables' values. Not caring means they can be either true or false. That's OK. What I have here is it can neither be true nor be false. That's not OK. That means one of the people, they are not, neither being called for the party nor, be, nor being not called for the party. So what is happening to them? You see what I'm saying? OK, so clearly, that's a failure. That basically, this as partial assignment is dead. This partial assignment is dead. OK, now, how would you figure this out? You will figure this out if you don't have any other ideas. What you do is you will expand this into a humongous subtree, all of which, when they come to the thousandth level, will fail. Since every one of these guys failed, you will come back here and consider P2 equal to false. This is what I mentioned to you. The worst thing you can do in search is expanding a dead guy. But unfortunately, figuring out who is dead is not easy. Remember, in the case of regression, we, 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 you know, we try to do this in the case of regression, too. You know, if we can figure out that a state is unreachable, then you can avoid expanding it. But figuring out unreachability is as hard as doing planning. And similarly here, figuring out that this cannot lead to any model, this partial assignment cannot lead to any model, is basically saying, take this entire theory, add two more formulas, P1 and P2, and show that this has no model. But you did this. Remember how to show there is no model? Theorem proving. Right? I mean, theorem proving is essentially if you wanted to prove alpha, you negate alpha, throw it into the knowledge base, and try to show that the knowledge base plus negated alpha has no model. Right? OK. So essentially, the way to do this is at each step, call the theorem prover. And if the theorem prover derives an empty class, then you don't have to go forward. That's it. That, no, obviously, going to work. In fact, in this particular case, theorem prover would der derive an empty class. Propositional theorem prover would derive an empty class. So you prove to yourself that this guy is dead. So you don't have to go forward anymore. Efficiency-wise, that's a dumb idea. Because you're calling theorem proving itself is an exponential time procedure. You're trying to improve the, the, the complexity of this exponential time procedure by calling another exponential time procedure as a subroutine. That can't work. What did we do for regression? That was the same problem we had for regression too, right? I mean, to show that this is not reachable. So draw, call another planner and ask the planner to say that from the initial state, you can't reach this state. And if it says so, then you don't need to expand this node. Right? We didn't give up. I mean, we basically, I, we knew that is a dumb idea, but we did something else. What did we do? We, for example, could use mutex analysis in the planning graph and say, if a pair of things in the state are mutually exclusive, then it's for sure dead. Now, mutex analysis won't always show you unreachable states. But if it says some state is unreachable, it's for sure unreachable. So rather than focus on theorem proving, you focus on tractable classes of theorem proving. So do a cheap version of the theorem prover. If that guy says empty class, you know that there is an empty class. If that guy doesn't say empty class, there may still be an empty class. This should ring a huge big bell from last class, because when I was talking about unit resolution, I kept saying, that's exactly what it does. When unit resolution brings an empty class, then you know that the knowledge base is inconsistent. 
If it doesn't bring an empty class, then the knowledge base may still be inconsistent. You just are not sure. OK? So what I can do is I can take this knowledge base and run just unit resolution. Not the full theorem prover, not the full resolution theorem prover, but just the unit resolution theorem prover. That can be done in polynomial time. And if it says empty class, then you die. If not, then basically you continue. And if you know it's actually possible that the full theorem prover would have told you this is dead, but you will continue a little further, and the unit class will tell you you are dead now. And if you don't do anything at all, then you will still be dead at this level. A dead guy will eventually be seen to be dead guy. The question is, can you do that before you run out of patience and time, you know, and, and see you die? OK? Right? So this is the you know, point where you're going to do a sound but incomplete theorem prover to see if there is an inconsistency in the current model. If it says inconsistent, then you get back. OK? Now, so basically, I'm now going to be doing, so remember, we started talking about theorem proving and said theorem proving is nothing but using satisfiability solver and showing that there is no model. And now you want to use a satisfiability solver, and I'm saying that satisfiability solver is nothing but branching and using a theorem prover to show that the branch doesn't actually work. So theorem prover and satisfiable theorem proving and model finding are sort of, and I don't know how to draw this. And this is theorem proving, this is model finding. Yin and yang. You know, at each, le each level, you can intersperse them. That's a very deep idea. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, it's, you will keep seeing it. You know, you can either, most times, you will either branch or say that the current branch is not worth going forward on. Saying that the current branch is worth, not worth going forward on is theorem proving, or called inference in general. Theorem proving is also inference. And saying that I will branch is called search. So search and inference are yin and yang. Model finding and theorem proving are yin and yang. It's a very useful idea to understand. But its practical implication here is that while doing satisfiability solving, you now start using unit resolution, which you understood as part of theorem proving. Now you can see there is no correct order to present theorem proving and model finding, because they're interspersed. That's why I did mention model finding a little bit while talking about theorem proving. And I'm mentioning theorem proving a little bit while talking again about model finding. They're interspersed. OK? Now, if you understand that idea, if you understand that unit resolution is actually a good thing to, you know, any actual tractable resolution can be used to, you know, to in, in some polynomial time find an empty class, in which case you don't have to go forward on that node. Okay. Um, it actually turns out that what graph plan does in mutex propagation is a form of tractable resolution. You know, we don't need to get into the exact detail, but it's a particular form of tractable resolution. It too has the property that when it says something is inconsistent, it is inconsistent. But if it when it says it does, it doesn't say something is inconsistent, it may still be inconsistent. Okay. The max the so basically I can use theorem proving unit, unit resolution to have figured out that the moment I said p1 equal to true, p2 equal to true, this branch is actually dead. Actually, you can do even better. In fact, I don't even need to come to p2 equal to, I don't even need to come to p2 equal to true. As soon as I did p1 equal to true, I add p1 to this database, just do unit resolution. One of the classes I will learn is not p2. Do you believe me or not? OK, let's see this, OK? So if I add p1, then p1, and then p1 implies 
P1000. This can also be seen as not P1 or P1000. Unit resolution will take these two away and write P1000. And then there's another unit resolution which says P2 implies not P1000. That is nothing but not P2 or not P1000. You resolve this and this away and you get not P2. So not P2 is a clause for you now. It's a constraint. How do you make not P2 constraint be satisfied? You do it by setting P2 equal to false. false. So in fact, you don't have to do unit resolution after the damage and to say that the patient is dead. But you can use unit resolution to say, as soon as you did P1 equal to true, you are now forced to take P2 equal to false. Beautiful. Right? That's basically what davis Watson procedure does. OK? So going back to my algorithm, um, if, uh, you know, if you currently have a, OK, this part. For, don't look at this. Look at it from here onwards. Uh, find the unit class in the class S model. So the current class S, take the current class S and the model. The model is important because model is giving you these additional constraints. So that new database is really the model plus the current, plus the old classes, original classes. OK? And you run unit resolution. When you run unit resolution, you can get smaller and smaller classes. But when you get unit classes, that's great. Because that means you're forcing assignments. One of the interesting things is that, in fact, instead of saying P1 implies P1000, P2 implies not P1000, um, if I had P1 implies P1000, P15 implies not P1000, Unit resolution now would have said, as soon as you pick P1 equal to true, the next thing you should do is go ahead and put P15 equal to false, which would have come to much later. In some sense, it's telling you which variables to pick. The ones that are forced, you may as well pick. Do you see what I'm saying? The ones which are forced, you may as well pick. So that's exactly what this guy is doing. You know, find unit classes. And for every unit class, essentially call DPLL with that class set to that value. So it's essentially now there are parts where DPLL is no longer branching because the other branch doesn't make any sense. That cuts down a whole bunch of search. Now you do spend time doing finding unit classes, a polynomial amount of time. But not surprisingly, you save a lot more time because you are catching failures before they happen. OK? This idea, is basically, this is general idea of forward checking. Remember SAT, I said, is a special case of CSP, where CSP uh, has variables with multiple values, not just Boolean values. Not just true and false, but you, know, you can have a variable called color, which can be red, blue, orange, and green, and so on. OK, so the general notion here, what we're doing is you're checking ahead based on your current decisions. You made some current decisions. You're checking ahead to see whether the set of current decisions forces you into certain corners. If so, you might as well go ahead and take them into account. Do you see what I'm saying? So for example, you know, you have, uh, you know, you woke up and you, for example, um, did not actually submit something which has a deadline today, and its result will come 10 days later. You didn't submit it today. You already know that you won't know anything about the result. So you might as well now start taking that into account, rather than be freshly surprised 10 days later that nobody told me what happened to my application. You knew. You didn't submit the application. So you, know, you just forward checked and put that as part of your reasoning. Now, of course, we humans are particularly good at deluding ourselves that, you know, maybe some miracle will happen, you know, so, but, you know, that delusion doesn't cut down your search. 
Okay, so forward checking essentially is taking into account consequences of the decisions you already made. At, you know, ahead of time rather than wait until you know the dark bitter end. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, then the other interesting idea, which actually Davis Putnam procedure doesn't do, but I mentioned last class as a very good idea, is variable ordering. Because normally you can pick any order, variables in any order, but some orders are more efficient than others. Now, Davis Putnam procedure does have an idea. If a variable is forced, then it will be picked right away. So it does have something to say about which variables to use. But if a variable is not forced, it just says leave it alone. You pick any variable. And so if you come back to this, you know. If the variable is forced, then it will pick that. Otherwise, pick just the first of the rest of the symbols. That's like saying I have no better idea. Unless your rich uncle went and put variables in the right order, so that when you pick it first, you will be the right, you have picked the right variable. Okay? So this also can have a heuristic. What could be a heuristic for this? I mentioned that what you want to do is to pick the variable that is most constrained. Uh, equivalently, pick the variable that's most constraining. Okay, So that by that variable, other things will just fall into place. I mean, you do this in your decision making. You know, if you have to make like a big plan, you know, about maybe going to Paris or something, you know, everything is up in the air. I don't know when I'm going, I don't know where I'm going, I just want to go to Paris. That's not going to help. You do, for example, make the flight reservation. That tells you at least when you have to go to the airport and when you will get out of, you know, De Gaulle Airport. Right? And that sort of constraints the rest of the things. Okay? Do you see what I'm saying? So that's the idea that we want to capture in picking the variables. Okay? Um, the, you know, things like, you know, why do you decide when you're going to Paris, why don't you decide what you would be eating from the McDonald's in champs LC uh, on the first day? You don't decide that normally. That's not like the most important decision you make when you're deciding how to go to Paris. You first decide what flight you're going to take. Why, is, why are you doing this? Because you sort of have knowledge about how the world works. You know that you can always pick whatever you want from you know, the random McDonald's that's, that are littering the place everywhere. Okay? Whereas if you don't get the flight, then you're going to pay a large amount of money. Okay, so that's like your parents told you, or you learned over a period of time, and your search algorithm has to figure this out online. That's why it's interesting. And so it needs to figure out which is most constraining, and one idea for our SAT algorithms is the following. For each of the variables, let's say I'm trying to decide between P and Q, whether to branch on P first or branch on Q first. Notice from a SAT point of view, the variable that's worth branching on is the one that somehow makes more either empty classes or unit classes come out. Okay, so what I would actually do, one idea, is um, to is to actually do the following thing. Um, I'm going to decide between P and Q. So for P, consider remember there's already you know my classes and my current model. Okay, so I consider deciding branching on P, say P true, P false. So this whole thing plus P, this whole thing plus my negative P. Do unit resolution here, do unit resolution here. Find the size of the remaining, the number of empty, number of unit classes you are able to derive. So let's say you are able to derive seven empty unit classes here, nine unit classes here. Then again, do the same thing for Q. And then suppose this you can derive two unit classes here, three unit classes here. <coughs> Clearly, this is better because this is deriving more unit classes. That means it, it puts into place many more of your future decisions if you decide this first. In essence, that's why you pick the flight first because 
the flight decision decides many other things whereas whether you're going to have fries or you know drink with your burger on the second day night in shamdi rsc is not going to make anything else be different you see what i'm saying okay so you do this and this is this is one way of figuring out which variable to pick now notice how much work you are doing to pick just the variables this is another of the examples where nobody in their right mind would consider doing this because they would think this is too much work to decide what variable to pick and the final solution the final algorithm that uses that kind of an idea cannot possibly be fast right this is the reason why in planning people never even considered doing costly heuristics in the beginning they would just assume those costly heuristics are so costly that they can't possibly do well for the entire planning because the heuristic cost plus search cost can't possibly be good whereas if you take set difference maybe you'll do much better and then we now know of course because you have you know you are fortunate enough to be alive now as again as 20 30 years back um you know that that's a silly idea and you actually have to try it be sure and not surprisingly this idea was not tried um at the time of dpll because they would never even consider that to be working as as a possible thing that is worth shaking because it will not work after all and remember i said your biases ultimately are more worrisome than anything else because the biases stop you from trying something okay so this was 62 dpll was 62 and this idea that i mentioned is has been tried in a sat server called sat z in 1997 62 to 97 that's what collective intelligence finally took to try out this because it doesn't look like an idea that's worth trying and when they tried i mean given that i took all this time to explain it to you huh when they tried they found sat z which the heck out of not doing sat z okay one more idea where spending again that's the, the picture is you know the the beautiful picture that we have of uh, this the cost of uh, heuristic computation the cost of search the real issue is where is the minimum and don't trust your intuitions always because intuitions especially because of the laziness would say i'm pretty sure or i so i hope that the heuristic computation should be cheap i should be i should be able to write the heuristic in two lines code in the sat z the heuristic computation takes most of the time really and it actually needs little more you know code than the dpl procedure and yet that's what helps dpl okay so that's the idea and if you understood this this is the variable ordering heuristic and you know for normal csp any general csp most constraint first variable is a great idea and that can be in in normal csp it's sort of interpreted in terms of the variable that has the least number of feasible values left is picked first that's why you pick bill gates over me because you assume bill gates has very few feasible values left and so you pick him first to decide ask him you know when whether or not he's available and then you ask me okay but the same thing is interpreted in sat in this more complex way because in sat really a variable only has two values left one value left or zero values left if it is one value left you will just actually use it directly if it is zero values left you just declare failure if it's two values left that's everybody else so just counting the number of remaining values doesn't help and so in fact you will need something more interesting but the underlying idea is the same you know this variable the variable that leads to many more cascade of um unit classes is essentially a most constraining variable the taking flight 
decision is the most constraining then because it constrains everything else. Whereas having fries with your burger decision is not as constraining because it doesn't seem to constrain anything else. And you do the most constraining ones first. Unless you are in delusions and you want to just keep the inevitable as far as possible so that you can go you know, forward somewhere. Okay? So that's the variable ordering. Um, now, there is, in the old, in the original DPLL, there is a minor idea which is actually not as interesting, but it's there. You know, it's right there in the middle of the algorithm called pure symbol, which is basically what I used earlier. Remember, if I have a whole bunch of classes which start with P, M, J, P, not Q, R, P, W, C, blah, blah, blah. In all of them, P is true. So set P true, you're done. Are there more models to this theory? Yeah, maybe. But one model is P true. So if in the remaining set of classes, a variable is occurring with only one polarity, polarity being positive or negative, then just commit to that polarity. And by doing that, you don't lose completeness. If there is a model at all, there will also be a model with that variable taking that polarity. Okay, so that is the pure symbol idea, a pure, pure literal elimination idea. So what they're saying is uh, you find a pure symbol, that means in the remaining classes, if there is any variable that only has the same polarity left, okay, then set that to that value. That's also a forced set. So here is one force set, here is another force set, and if you can't force set any of the variables, then you flip a coin and pick one of the remaining. That's DPL procedure. Does very well in practice. Okay. Um, here is a uh, an example of this whole thing in action. Uh, I'm going to go through it quickly, but you should look at it to make sure that you understand. Okay. Uh, basically, this is a trace of DPLR procedure. Okay, uh, this is our old example, the one that I've been showing you around all along. So, suppose I pick P, and I set P equal to true. The moment I set P equal to true, any time I make a decision, I assume I will either check for unit classes or do pure literal elimination. Okay, when P equal to true, I won't do. I mean, I would only show the ones that will you know, work. But your program itself will try both steps at each point, okay? So when you set P equal to true, of course, this class becomes satisfied, right? And if I do unit propagation, since P equal to true, Q must become true, right? Uh, I'm sorry, by the way, so P is true. So the step here basically is P is true, and PSU is satisfied, I remove, and then P and not P, Q implies Q is derived by the unit propagation, and so you must next set Q equal to true. Okay, and then now not PQ satisfied because Q has been set, so not PQ is now satisfied, so you can remove that from consideration. Remember, this is one branch. I'm just coming down one branch. One of the nice things is in, in as you come down one branch, the constraints keep getting added. When you backtrack, some constraints get removed, and then new constraints get added. Okay, in this example, actually, just a series of decisions will lead you. Without backtrack, you will lead, get to solution. That's a nice thing about this example. So PQ is satisfied, you remove it, and so now you have two classes satisfied in this branch. Okay? Um, now, also, in fact, Q not ST is also satisfied because I said Q equal to true. Agreed? So that is also removed. Removed means you don't need to worry about it anymore in this branch. Okay? Now, since Q is true or not Q, R, R is true, R must be derived. And R is true. So go ahead and set R true. So this is like, this is first level of recursion, second level of recursion, third level of recursion already. Now you set R equal to true. Because you set R equal to true, not QR is satisfied. So you can, in this branch, you can remove that from consideration. Okay? And so is RS satisfied. So you can remove that from consideration. At this point, finally, in the remaining classes, S is appearing only negatively. Right? 
right? Okay, so I can go ahead and say not s equal to true or s equal to false. Okay, s equal to false. I'm done. This is a backtrack free. I mean, you won't be this lucky all the time, but it shows you the power of the ideas that we put together. Something that has those many clauses, you just had backtrack free series, you know, you went to the solution. By the way, the word backtrack free is, is a good thing to know. If anybody says the search can be done backtrack free, that means essentially it's, it's not search. The last time I talked about backtrack free search is when? It's equal to no. A star does backtrack, of course. I mean, in the sense, it does, you know, it, it does go back and forth, you know. No. 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 But I'm just curious to see, you know, whether people have. But this is like across. Yes, first with a single plan. No. It's it's thinking in the wrong chapter. <laughs> Think planning. What? Yeah. The class that some of you didn't attend. <laughs> Relax plan extraction. In the case of relaxed plan, the reason relaxed plan is easy is because you can pick any supporter for the condition. You will be able to go all the way down. Remember, we talked about this. If you want the optimal relaxed plan, then the fact that you can get a plan is not enough. You want to get the cheapest plan. There you have to compare. So that will become NP complete. But finding a relaxed plan can be done linear time, basically, because you can do backtrack free all the way down. Backtrack free is a good thing. Part of the jargon that you want to know. OK? So in this case, SAT is normally not backtrack free. In this particular example, DPLL went backtrack free to the solution. Nice. Means you put together a set of good ideas. OK? You learn some really neat points about CSP if you understood this, because you understood about the fact that CSP has finite search tree, that all the solutions are at the bottom, and if a, if a partial solution is dead, you don't need to go forward on it any further. If a partial solution satisfies all the constraints, then the rest of the guy's values, it doesn't matter what you pick, okay? And if a partial solution can be proved to be dead using any forward checking procedures, any limited inference procedures, then that's good. And you want to pick variables to assign uh, with most constrained variable first. If you understand this, this is in the heart of CSP, heart of SAT as well as CSP. And these ideas are very useful across you know, lots and lots of normal your life situations. You do this all the time without thinking. OK? Ah, so. And as I said, SATZ picks the variable setting such that the one that is picked leads to the most unit resolutions. And that's what I was doing here. Count the number of unit classes. OK. That looked like a pretty complex algorithm, right? I mean, first of all, I, there's too much build up. And then there was, you know, there's a normal uh, idea. And then there's a extra idea and so on. You know, extra idea you know, forward checking and uh, dynamic variable argument. I will now tell you an idea that you can, uh, is actually, yeah, an idea that you can teach um, your uh, first grade and a few earnings. Okay? And it actually does better sometimes. Um, you know, and that idea is as simple as the following. Again, consider this, right? Look, you're looking for, you're looking for, models, right? Guess a model. Just guess one, complete assignment, OK? That's for example. Assign, let's assume, let's guess that all the variables are equal to false. That's my mod, my assignment. And check if all the clauses are satisfied. If you're one of the luckiest dudes alive, <laughs> your guess would be right. And you say, I'm done, OK? Most likely, you won't be you know, that lucky. So you would find some clauses are not satisfied. OK? If it's none of the clauses are satisfied, then it's a solution already. Then some clauses are not satisfied. Now, so that means your guess is not good. 
you need to tweak something. So for example, you come to me and say, here's my solution. I say, wrong. OK, then I say, change this part. Is it right? I say, wrong. Change this part. Is it right? I say, wrong. That's what we do. OK, how do you write paper? I mean, how do you write assign, you know, the term papers? You know, uh, you never search systematically in the space of all good term papers and pick the optimal term paper. If you did, you never wrote a term paper. Right? What do you do? You make a term paper, look at it, and say, oh, the word seems to be putting some things under red, so let's fix those. And then something it's putting in green, let's put six those two. Let's act as if we read it ourselves once, make some more changes, and say, looks good. You know, put a plastic cover and give it to the teacher. What did you do? You didn't think in like, you know, first let's figure out what should be the organization, etc. You wrote an entire term paper and tweaked it for a while and then gave it to me. I'm going to do that now. So I picked an entire model. I looked at it. Even I couldn't be convinced that it is a model yet because some classes are directly violated. Okay? So then I need to tweak it. The question then is how do I tweak? How do I tweak the model? I could do the following. I could just pick a completely different model. So for example, you make a term paper, you read it and say, ah, it doesn't look good. Do you just make it a ball, throw it out, and start from scratch again? You should, sometimes. The reason you write bad term papers is because you are stuck to your ideas. But from a search point of view, it's not at all wrong what you do, which is stick to the term paper, keep as much effort as possible, and make some syntactic changes and see if I'm happy to. And then let me delude myself that the teacher would be happy to. Right? So what you want to do is you, you have a current model. You need to tweak it to get the new model. OK. The question then is, what kind of tweaks are you considering? The most interesting, this, this idea that I'm talking about, this is tweaking search. This idea is called the tweaking search, or actually a better name for it is local search. So you have a solution. It's not working. So you're looking at the neighborhood of the solution, picking another solution that kind of looks better, commit to that. Reread it. If it's your paper, reread it. If it's your SAT assignment, reevaluate it. OK? Now, if in the case of SAT, I have n variables, and I've given all the variables valuations in my current assignment, and I tweak, if I allow any subset of variables to be changed, then my neighborhood is the entire search space. Obviously a dumb idea. So instead, we always do small tweaks. What would be the small tweak for this? What's the smallest <coughs> tweak you can think of? You gave me an n variable assignment. I said, no, it doesn't work. What's the smallest thing you can do? Change one variable. In the case of SAT, changing a variable means <coughs> flipping it. Because its current value is true, flip it, it becomes false. If it is false, flip it, it becomes true. This idea is also actually useful for CSP, in which case you actually have to find another value. But in the case of SAT, there are only two values. So you know, if you're changing this, then you just pick the other value for the variable. OK, now the question is, ultimately, which variable are you going to flip? If you're only going to flip one variable, right, you want to maybe at least think a little. You know, so I have one more change I want to do to my term paper. So what should I do? And you know, I could, for example, rewrite the abstract or put a semicolon in the conclusion section or maybe put the title in green instead of purple. OK? And you think a little before doing just one of them arbitrarily. You know, you might think maybe rewriting the abstract is the first thing I should do of these three tweaks. OK? I can do this for my SAT solver, too, Okay, which is, so for example, I picked, uh, I assume my original assignment is all false. <coughs> and uh, it violated, it violated essentially two clauses, PSU and RS. The PSU uh, clause is violated, because if P and all of them are false, PSU is false, too. OK? RS is also false. Everything else becomes true because at least each of those clauses have at least one negated literal, and so it'll become false. 
right? Okay, now, so I need to, so PSU and others are related. So let me say that I want to now make at least one of these constraints be satisfied. Okay, so that means either I have to flip a variable in this set or flip a variable in this set. Okay, suppose I arbitrarily decided that I will satisfy this constraint first, RS. I still have an option. Do I flip R or flip S? Here I will do some intelligent thinking. I'll consider flipping R and see how many clauses will now be violated. And I'll consider flipping S, and I'll see how many clauses will be violated. Whichever leads to fewer clauses being violated is what I will pick. This idea is also called, apart from being called local search, it's also called hill climbing. If you're stuck in some arbitrary point of a hill, and you're not sure that you are yet at the top, okay? And you are deciding which way to step. Okay? And the way we figure out is, okay, I go this way, my elevation is increasing. I go this way, my elevation is reducing. If I go this way, my elevation is remaining the same. If I go this way, my elevation is remaining the same. So among these, since I want to have the highest elevation possible, I'll go this way. That's how people hill climb. That's why they get stuck on foothills, right? When you reach a foothill, then every step you make, you fall down. And so you are basically, if you use hill climbing algorithm to reach Mount Whitney, for example, won't work because Mount Whitney is the tallest peak in the continent of the United States, but it's like barely taller than everything else around it. And hill climbing will get you to one of those guys. If you use it for Everest, you will get stuck in Makalu, which is the closest peak that's way below Makalu. So you can see Everest, it's out there, but you don't know what to do because any of the local steps you do will get you down. So then what do you do at that time? So before getting there, so what I'm, my idea is the following. Essentially, I will you know, pick, um, pick an assignment. If it is satisfying all the classes, I'm done. If it's not, then I will pick one of the violated classes, pick one of the variables and flip. And the choice of which variable to flip is based on whose flipping leads to least number of violated classes. That's sort of the merit, that's the elevation in the hill climbing metaphor. And then you, you know, commit to the one which you know, leads to the biggest, and then commit to that. Okay, and then now you have a new assignment. And check if the assignment is satisfying everything. If not, again, do this. Play this game again. That is greedy hill climbing search. Obviously, greedy hill climbing search sometimes gets stuck in local maxima or local minima. So you need to do something so that you will still be able to reach the global maximum. In the case of SAT, what you're looking for is the number of violated classes should become zero. You may get to a point where where you are, the number of violated classes currently is four, and anything you can flip will increase the number of violated classes to five or more. Then you will think, what's the point in flipping? This is as, bad or as good as it gets. I know it's not a great term paper, but anything I touch seems to make it worse. So at least get me some reasonable partial credit. Submit this. But if you have time, what do you do? You throw away this term paper, start afresh. You magically restart. As it goes with your term paper, so it goes with your search. Okay, so if you do, so the basic point is hill climbing is a good idea because it follows the local gradients in the search space. Local gradients in the search space. But local gradients may not necessarily get you to the global optimum. Okay, right? So, 
since you want to get to global optimum with higher probability, one idea is whenever you get stuck, whenever you get stuck, re restart. So magically, pick a completely different assignment randomly and start all over again. If you do that, probabilistically, you have completeness. OK? An interesting variation on that is either you be greedy, 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 and restart, or don't be so greedy any time. OK, what that means is when I have two variables in front of me, flipping this will lead to four, um, you know, so there are two variables in front of me. Flipping this will lead to four violated clauses. Flipping this will lead to three violated clauses. Don't always deterministically pick this. Use another coin, which comes up heads 90% of the time and tails 10% of the time. If it comes up heads, do the greedy thing. If it comes up tails, do non-greedy thing. If you do that, once again, just as restart search, this search also has asymptotic completeness. Do you understand what I'm saying? OK? So in fact, this is basically what a variation of that is what I wrote here, which is uh, start with a model from i equal to 1 to max flips, do the following. If a model satisfies, if the current model satisfies all the clauses, you're done. If not, you know, pick a one of the violated clauses. OK? That is false in the current model. OK? And then with probability p, whichever symbol in the class maximizes the number of satisfied clauses, pick that and flip it. Probability 1 minus p, pick any of them randomly. So in my hill climbing metaphor, with probability p, I will actually only make steps that increase my height, elevation. With 1 minus p, I will be making lateral steps. The way you get out of foothills is once in a while, get down from the Makalu, walk on the plains, hopefully not in the plains of India, but plains around Everest, and get back again onto Everest. And if you, do, if you don't even allow yourself that feasibility, you will never be complete. If you allow that feasibility, asymptotically you are complete. In any given amount of time, you may still not be done. Now, I give you a choice to write either the previous algorithm or this to solve SAT problems. Which would you pick? What? Who wants to pick previous? Really? This is so easy. <laughs> There's nothing to write here. I mean, I guess, you know, most people would just pick this because local search is so easy. By the way, remember when we were talking about search, we used to talk about memory? How much memory does this search take? It remembers the current assignment. Not even B times D. Constant memory. Local search takes constant memory. It almost feels, why the heck did you drag us through A star search, systematic search, all this forward checking, backward checking, and now tell us this. At least please tell us that this doesn't work well in practice. Unfortunately, it does work extremely well in practice. <clears throat> OK? Now, can you use this as the basis for theorem proving? Notice that if I give you a really nice working, uh, working implementation of DPLL, can you use it for theorem proving? So I have a propositional theory. I want you to show that alpha can be proved. You negate alpha, throw it into the theory, give it to DPLL. And if the DPLL says no model, alpha is proved. You could use it, right? Can you use this guy for theorem proving? If there is no model, it doesn't know when, it, when to stop. The problem of not remembering where you have been 
is you can keep coming to the same place infinite number of times with the same smug grin on your face. Right? You'll never be done. You will basically you know, go to the same place infinite number of times, even though search space is finite. Now you might say, why don't you remember where you have been? Just have a little taboo list. Right? A taboo list where you say, I've been to this place. Don't go, again. go back again there. If you do that, what happens? What's the memory consumption now? Two power n. Nothing comes free. OK? In fact, there is an idea called taboo list idea, taboo search idea, where basically what they do is they will just have a limited amount of memory. A limited amount of memory, not two power n. You know, you don't have two power n memory, maybe. But neither are you so poor that you only have enough space to hold one assignment, right? You probably can afford a couple of assignments, OK? So suppose like you have a table in which you can remember k previous assignments. That's not bad. So you just put these k previous assignments here. Anytime you get to one of these assignments, then you say, no, I can't keep it. Then, of course, you know, now this is a paging scheme, like the operating system's paging scheme. When new assignment comes up, somebody here has to leave. And then you can talk about least recently used uh, and all that fun stuff. Somebody has to be retired so that you can make space for the new guys. That will make hill climbing a little more systematic. But it can be made completely systematic only when your taboo list becomes two power n size. And that's not as good. But if there is a solution, it can find it very fast. When there is no solution, it will never stop and tell you that there is no solution. So this idea is actually, this is a stochastic hill climbing idea for sat satisfiability solvers. Okay? And this idea works extremely well on solvable satisfiable problems. If the models, if there is a model, it will find it quite fast most of the time. Okay, if there is no model, then it may never end. In fact, this idea worked so good in practice, chronologically, this idea came in 1992. You know, again, biases ultimately stop us from trying ideas. Sad Z idea wasn't tried from 62 to 97 because you spent too much time computing heuristic. You can't possibly do well. This idea wasn't tried until 1992 because it's so simplistic, such a dumb idea. How can it work? Of course, you know, you have a computer, write it and see. Right? That's a reasonable thing to do. But, you know, obviously, collectively, we decided it's just a dumb idea. We won't try it. Makes no sense. And then in 1992, a bunch of uh, people who had nothing else to do basically tried it and found that they can beat the heck out of all the other sad solvers at that time. for solvable problems. For unsolvable problems, basically, they just have to have a time limit. And if you can't find it in 30 minutes, then assume that it has no solution. But that's actually not true. OK. Um, I'm going to actually take five more minutes. Uh, if you have to leave, please leave. But I, there is one point I want to make about the phase transition here, uh, which is I'm very close to. And then it will be recorded. And if you have to leave, you can watch it later. Um, okay. um, the GSAT worked so well in practice that people started wondering, are there actually hard SAT problems? Remember, SAT is supposed to be NP-complete. That means there should be exponentially hard problems. OK? And yet, GSAT, this idea was called GSAT. OK? It was solving any random SAT problem you throw at it very fast. So people started wondering, are there really any hard set problems? OK? And that's where it, the question is, where are the hard problems? If you randomly generate sad problems, where are the hard sad problems? OK? That gets us to this beautiful point about phase transition, which is, you know, I mentioned earlier. Consider three sad, just general three sad problems. Okay, three set will have all classes would be exactly of size three. Okay, consider the number of classes divided by the number of variables in the set instance. 
Okay? Right? So for example, for this, how many classes are there? Seven. How many variables? P, Q, R, S, T, U, six. Seven by six is the value here. For this particular guy, it's seven by six. Okay, so for any random SAT instance, just consider this critical parameter called the number of classes by the number of variables. Okay, it can be very large or very small or somewhere in between. It's a number, it's a real number. Okay, let's try to think about what we expect the hardness of, the, what do you expect the probability that there will be a solution for a SAT instance which has a certain gamma value, okay? So this is the gamma I'm talking about. So gamma is close to this side, let's say, close to zero. That means the number of classes to number of variables is close to zero. That means there are zero classes and many, many variables. If I say, here are all the variables and there are no constraints whatsoever, is it, what is the probability that there will be a solution for this sad problem? 100%. Because every possible assignment is a solution. How hard would it be for you to find a solution? Very easy. <coughs> right? So on this end, the probability of finding solution would be close to 1.0, and the time you spend finding the solution would be close to zero. Okay? Now, if I go to the other end, where gamma is close to infinity, that means I have two variables and 15,000 classes on them. Is there any possible way, what is the probability that you would satisfy all those classes? Very low. Okay, so another way of thinking about this in my way is that if you have like one homework to do and two years to do it, anybody can do it. Okay, if you have 15,000, and then you would basically be done. You know that you will be done and you will be done. If you have 15 million homeworks to do and this weekend to do it, the probability you will get done is close to zero. How hard would it be for you to realize that it's not worth wasting time on it and I should rather go to a movie? <laughs> right? 15 million homeworks and I say any of them you don't do, you fail this course. You say, why waste my weekend? Let's at least have fun at the movie. So the difficulty, the probability of solving is zero, but the difficulty of solving the problem is also zero. Right? Because it's not solvable and you know it's not solvable. So this is the game I have to play. If it is too easy, it will be too easy and you won't be spending any time. If it is too hard, it would be too hard and you won't be spending any time. So I need to make it such that it just about looks doable, so you'll waste a lot, not waste, spend a lot of time. <laughs> spend a lot of time, right? Because then I get points. You know, the amount of brain cells used not on Facebook are points for me. Okay, right? So. It's clear to you by this discussion that the hard problems are those which are in the middle. And you, even if you, you know, if you just had common sense, you would have figured out by this that perhaps the probability of satisfaction for a random SAT problem with a certain gamma value starts from one and goes to zero in some nice, slow way. Similarly, the probability, the difficulty of solving it would be cheap here, cheap here, and maybe like a nice little bell curve, some smooth bell curve, because somewhere in the middle it should be hard. If you're surprised at this, you're not a computer science student. Because remember that the less you know about the world, more surprising it is, right? Oh, you mean you switch this and the light comes on? Wow, you know, that's because you don't know that lights work. You shouldn't be surprised at this. This is just common sense for computer scientists. It's not common sense for your you know, two-year-old nephew, but not for you. It, it is common sense for you. Now for the surprise. If you actually do this experiment, you generate um, the classes 
generate the you know three sat uh, uh, problems randomly, okay, at different gamma values and plot the probability of satisfying an instance as well as the difficulty of solving it. It looks more like that. So the probability of solving a random instance is close to one up until here, close to zero here, and it falls precipitously here. That's surprising. And not, on, not surprisingly, the difficulty of solving the problem is close to zero most of the time. Here it is zero because any random assignment is a model. Here it is zero because your unit resolution will give you a, an empty class right away. Either way, you're done. And it becomes hard only in the middle. Shoot, phase transition. Now, if that happens, the question then is, before it was, there is no middle, you didn't have to ask exactly where are the hard problems. Because of course, somewhere in the middle are the hard problems. Now, you must be interested. Where are these hard problems exactly? Because this seems to be a single point. Well, it turns out that essentially you can be, you can, you know, that this transition has to occur when about when the probability of satisfaction I and mean, the probability of finding a satisfying model for the, the problem is about 50%. So you really have to go through all the models to check whether any of them survive. If most models are going to be dead, then you would be right just assuming that it can't be solved. If any model works, you would be right by just picking it. It's in the middle, you have to enumerate all of them. It is at the 50% satisfied level <coughs> where things become things go haywire. What is surprising, however, is up until then everything is calm. Water boiling is interesting only because at 100 degrees water goes haywire. Up until then it's okay, sort of, and then at 100 degrees all of water wants to become vapor. That's phase transition. This actually explains to you why people want finding hard problems. By the way, it turns out you know, that this point is gamma equal to 4.3. And it cannot be proved. It's only empirically observed. And to show you how robust that phenomenon is, um, here is a picture. Uh, this, is, this is a plot from somebody's science fair project, where all they did was to implement DPLL with just pure backtracking, no unit resolution. No um, pure literal elimination, just simple pure backtracking. So much so that they couldn't solve more than 30 variable instances fast enough. And they still could produce this. Again, as expected, you know, pretty sharp fall. And then around 50%, you have the highest amount of time spent. Very robust phenomenon. OK? You can actually reason about this. You can look at it later on and see. You can establish like an upper bound as to where, basically, you can at least figure out. You know that at the 50% probability of satisfaction, what happens, interestingly, is in, in most of this area, any of the models are solutions. There are about two of our n solutions in this region. There are how many solutions in this region? Zero. zero. Two power n goes to zero. And it becomes exactly one in the middle. So if you compute what this particular slide does, is it essentially makes a whole bunch of independence assumptions, uses elementary probability theory to compute the probability of having exactly one solution. And that would be this particular formula. And if you plug k equal to 3, um, you'll get 5.19 as the gamma. That is the upper bound. Okay, It still doesn't tell you that things are supposed to go phase transition. It tells you if there is a phase transition, where the phase transition is going to be. And the fact that phase transition exists, uh, and in fact, you know, people have done a whole bunch of work, and from this side, people kept proving Upper bounds have become tighter and tighter and tighter. Proofs, OK, up to 4.596. Lower bounds have become tighter and tighter and tighter, up to 3.2. Empirically, we know it's about 
but there is no actual mathematical proof. But understanding that the phase transition exists helps you understand why we could not easily find hard SAT problems. Because imagine you randomly generate a SAT problem. What's the probability that you would be in this narrow band? Quite low. You see what I'm saying? So to, if you really want to see where the hard SAT problems are, you need, and on the random SAT problems, you need to set gamma equal to 4.3, and then say, I am better than you. And that's what the GSAT guys actually wound up doing. They were also connected to this particular work. So GSAT guys were you know, breaking everybody's back, and then they then realized that there's too many easy problems. There should be really hard problems so that then I can show that I do well on the hard problems. And then you know, around that time, this understanding of phase transition came. Phase transition is a pretty robust phenomenon. Actually, it occurs for many combinatoric problems, not just for SAT. First of all, it's not just for 3 SAT. It turns out it can occur, you know, for 3 SAT, it is about 5.19. Uh, I mean, it's actually 4.3, and uh, 2 sad, it's like about 2.4, 4 sad, it's about 10.74. You can even reason out as to why the phase transition has to go that way. 